Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Paul Fenner. I'm the National Head of Construction for BDO. I'm just going to wait a few moments just to see that there are more people joining because they're joining as we speak. So if you just bear with us for a couple of seconds as I see the numbers going up. Okay. Thank you. So first thing I wanted to say is uh, from all of us at BDO, um, we hope you and your respective teams, your families, your loved ones are all safe and well. If, if uh, Sharon, could you switch to the next slide, please? Thanks. And the next one, sorry, yeah, thanks. So today, uh, the agenda's short and sweet. Uh, we'll try and wrap up within an hour. Uh, I'm joined by some of my colleagues, Lee, Ollie, and Rob, uh, who will be presenting as well. But we've got a very special guest, John Wardle, uh, who is the CEO of Claritas. Uh, we're fortunate to have his personal viewpoint from the industry on both COVID and themes from the recent construction survey that we sent out to you. I, I've also got to, at this stage, touch on some housekeeping points. So uh, apologies, but uh, it's got to be done. Um, today's webinar is obviously going to be recorded. I hope that's OK. Uh, we'll circulate the slides and recordings in probably about a week's time, if that's OK. Uh, we'll also be looking to produce a report from these findings. All your lines are automatically muted throughout the webinar. Uh, but if you want to submit questions to the panel, you can do that using the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of Zoom. Um, if you want to ask questions after the um, the webinar because once the webinar is finished that the Q&A function will be ceased but if you want to ask questions afterwards uh, my email address will be on the last page so you can email your questions to to myself and what we'll do is we don't get if we don't get through all of the questions or you've got additional questions we'll try and get back to you shortly after the uh, webinar if any reason you have problem with the sound or the technical issues with zoom uh, please let us know you can do this using the chat function um, we'll try and sort as quickly as possible Clearly, uh, I would recommend, it's, I know it's stating the obvious, but if you can, try exiting and going back in, uh, into it, and sometimes that works. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Sharon. What I thought I'd set out is some key facts around the construction sector, a bit of an economic uh, update and review. It's been a, a, a good year, actually, for construction despite COVID. Uh, it's performed um, you know, fairly well. The construction sector is clearly one of the largest uh, sectors. I call it a barometer to the others. Uh, it's uh, it usually, you know, when construction does well, the others seem to do well. Um, what I also uh, look at is the number of cranes. Obviously, the number of cranes in the skyline usually means economic growth and success of a city. Construction con accounts for 7% of GDP. 10% of the workforce in the UK work in construction. And that's still the case, even despite COVID, if those numbers still stand and have been pretty static year on year. It also demonstrates uh, the scale and the size of the sector. During COVID, and you'll be aware of this more than I will, um, you know, government has obviously had a number of initiatives backing throughout coronavirus. Boris's build, build, build campaign is one. Uh, obviously construction being regarded as, as uh, essential and sites remained open. Uh, no stamp duty on houses, uh, less than half a million. All of these have really helped the construction, construction sector as a whole uh, defy the odds and grow pretty much back now to pre-pandemic levels. And it's been very resilient throughout the whole of the pandemic. Certain subsectors of construction have done particularly well. I'd name infrastructure, private housing, repair and maintenance and fit out. Uh, we all know that fit out is, uh, is, is something which we're now looking at the way we work, whether we work in office or home, and clearly fit out and redesign of office space uh, is, is key going forward. New build accounts for 60% of the sector's revenues. It's actually grown 3.5% last month. Um, private commercial, though, on the other hand, um, did see at one stage a 50% drop. That's new offices, really, and particularly in London. Uh, but we are and have seen reports, I think there was a report from JLL, uh, recently that actually said this wouldn't be a long-term issue and office space will be uh, will come back. The biggest winners are supermarkets, healthcare, logistics um, and clearly unfortunately because of these sectors of, uh, are performing poorly uh, themselves during Covid, uh, the biggest losers are construction of retail, aviation, leisure and hospitality. Interestingly the furlough in the construction sector has actually been very very low 
2.7% compared to the average 15% from other sectors. And again, because construction is essential, um, most have returned back to either their sites or their normal place of work compared to the other sectors. Next slide, please, Sharon, thanks. You'll all be familiar with this. Um, and again, I think what it's showing is the typical V-shaped curve. Clearly the dip was during March to April, 2020 when COVID was in its first lockdown. But as you can see, and quite um, pleasingly, uh, the graph is now showing that we're pretty much back to pre-pandemic levels, certainly for repair and maintenance anyway. We know that during the first lockdown, uh, there was much confusion over what construction sites were essential. Um, and it took time uh, to work out and implement social distancing measures required. And, and also the manufacturers of the raw materials couldn't meet the demand as they weren't deemed as essential. And they were either saving the materials for what was considered essential, such as hospitals, etc., or they just weren't able to, to meet demand and they weren't be able to supply. So actually a number of these issues um, have, you know, they've now gone away. And actually what we've seen in the second and the third lockdowns, uh, they didn't impact the construction sector as much. So hence we are back to pre, pretty much pre-pandemic levels. Next slide, please, um, Sharon. What I've tried to set out here is, uh, again, it's quite um, uh, muddy with lots of uh, lines, but what, what is clear here is infrastructure and private new housing are the winners and they're performing exceptionally well. Other subsectors, uh, private commercial, as I mentioned earlier, and some public sector work, they've started to pick up, but they're not quite yet back to February 20 levels, the pre-pandemic levels. Next slide, please. What I've set out here and I, uh, is really the survey, and this is the main reason for having the webinar. And I wanted to thank each and every one of you that uh, were kind enough to fill in that survey. It's given us some really good insight into some of the key challenges that you face. Um, I'll give you a quick canter through some of the construction survey questions that you answered and the results from them. Um, hopefully you can read the slide, uh, but a uh, bit, bit busy. We had over 100 responses across public sector, private companies, subsectors across all of the uh, construction sectors, uh, and also across the UK, covering pretty much all the regions. So it was, good, it was a good, good coverage. The main thing that we picked up on was that 86% of the results uh, were positive. In fact, 16% were very positive. Um, and the outlook uh, was um, for, the, for the outlook for next year, which I think is fantastic. I think it's also though to do with uh, the fact that a number of construction entities have secured their order books already ahead for usually one to two, two years. So it may have been that when you answer those questions, 2021 isn't actually the, the issue here. It's actually further and beyond that's more uncertain. I also don't want to paint too rosy a picture because you know, we, whilst it's fantastic that the construction sector is positive, uh, clearly uh, great news, but furlough when that stops and companies have to start repaying loans and tax deferments. I think particularly other sectors, which construction builds for, they are very nervous of the outlook and the potential looming recession. So it's not clear how many of these companies in other sectors are gonna struggle. And that will have an impact, whether direct or indirect on the construction sector. Next slide, please, Sharon. We asked you in the survey what you thought the key challenges you face for 2021 and beyond. Uh, clearly skills gaps, supply chain resilience, and I, th I think this is the fear of the unknown. Could there be further COVID restrictions uh, be thrust upon us? And th those are the main concerns. You were, you were nervous of the resilience of your supply chain, particularly post-Brexit uh, deal, because the you know nobody knew what was going to happen. But but clearly a significant proportion of raw materials in the construction sector, such as bricks, cement, concrete, comes from, it, comes from the EU. Uh, we also have the domestic reverse charge that's being introduced, which could overnight impact a number of subcontractors uh, in, and their working capital by reducing it by 20%. Areas that you felt, um, sorry, if it, the next slide, please, Sharon, <laughs> just realized. Uh, areas where you felt we needed to improve our confidence in the industry, um, interestingly, greater collaboration, and, and I say interestingly because we, we found, or we experienced certainly from talking to a number of our clients, that actually they the collaboration had improved. So they were talking far more closely with the employer and supply chain, particularly around uh, better payment practices. 
And, you know, as far as we're concerned, this behavioural practice, we hope, continues long after COVID's gone, gone away. There's also the need to continue invest in innovation and new technologies. And I don't think that's new. You know, the R&D, new techniques and how to improve margins, which are already low, has always been uh, quite key in this industry. But we never seem to get there and it always seems to be, you know, behind manufacturing, for instance. Improvement of skills through training, multi-skilling and apprenticeships is up there as well. And I think that's good so that we can become more efficient in using our labour force. Next slide, please, Sharon. So um, the areas where you felt uh, we, um, we needed to invest in, I think a lot of these have already been touched on. So R&D and innovation, we just talked about. Winning more on talent, uh, recruiting the best, retaining the best, um, investing in BIM and more meaningful management information systems, back office IT is very key, really, to understand and concentrate on the profitable and higher margin work. Offsite manufacturing and M&A were also high on this list. Um, and I was I was actually interested to see M&A activity high, possibly acquisitions of and investments of new technologies, modular, etc. Next slide, please. Um, your key concerns, which kind of overlaps challenges, again, labour, you know, productivity, uh, getting it right first time, you know, wastage on construction sites uh, needs to be uh, reduced significantly. And that's really through skills, training. And, and what we also saw is the skills gap, ageing workforce uh, being um, something that you're, you're looking at again uh, in terms of trying to address. A few themes that I'm sure that uh, Ollie um, and John and um, and Lee will touch on as well. So that's that's it really from me. Um, I wanted to thank you for listening. Um, that really was a quick canter through the uh, through the survey, and I'm hoping now we can go into a little bit more detail into some of those areas. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce John Wardle. Uh, John is the CEO of Claritas, and he's going to give you a little bit about his own viewpoint on the industry and the results. So over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you to BDO and thank you for this opportunity and, and ongoing support. Um, you know, please accept these as my humble opinions as we go through this. Um, Sharon, if you, next slide, please. Just a little bit about for those that, that Claritas that don't know us. Um, we, we do have a mighty vision and a mighty ambition, and that is to change the way the industry procures, constructs and hands over projects with an absolute uh, focus on two-way transparency. And that's something that we believe and, and working with our customers in a very different way. Uh, we see examples of it, of it being truly lacking from our, from our industry. The, one of the things that we always say is that, that whatever we do, uh, they must be replicable and our behaviors must underpin the purpose. Uh, and that's the purpose of two-way transparency. Uh, again, all too often in our industry, um, the behaviours don't uh, match up with the rhetoric and the way that we want to do things. But on the positive, I do think, you know, we've all seen some excellent behaviours, both from customers, ourselves and supply chain uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Next slide, please, Sharon. So operating through COVID, some of the key themes that I guess we've uh, kind of recognised First off, sort of like our financial performance, actually, you know, we, we're a, a growing business and we're, and we're growing significantly. At our business plan this year was uh, 35 million. We're actually going to do about 39, 40 uh, and without shutting sites for six weeks in lockdown one. And obviously the slow period into lockdown one and the slow period out of uh, lockdown one, we would have probably more like 50 million. That was always our, our jump into the business plan for 2021 and 22. And we're kind of we're looking at a business plan for 21, 22 of about 76 million. And as you can see there, we've principally got that secured, uh, the blue representing the secured, which underpins our 90, 95 million pound target for 22, 23. So we're, we're in a very good place. And like many of us, we're quite, uh, quite optimistic, quite excited by the future from that point of view. And, and that supports our, our big growth ambitions from that point of view. But what, what have we seen throughout COVID? I guess the key theme for us would be that when, nece when necessity requires, the whole value chain can collaborate at both the business around both the business and the project objectives. 
Um, and what I mean by that, and, and Paul alluded to it earlier, is the open and honest, transparent conversations about project delivery, time and money and financial consequence around completion, around how we manage material deliveries, how we manage procurement, um, and also about how we manage resources. Again, up and down the value chain, how we attend meetings, how we manage meetings, how we progress design, how we progress procurement. Um, and I think you know, that has been a huge positive for us. The, the watchword that I would put to that is not in our business, and we certainly haven't seen it from our customers or our supply chain, but we are having active conversations with members of the supply chain who are starting to see some of the old habits die hard uh, and are starting to creep back. And that's around reduction in payment notices. That's around uh, impacts of time and, and people really now starting to talk about the consequences of kind of what might have happened through lockdown one, lockdown two, lockdown three, and where we are today. Um, and I think we've all got to take responsibility for those behaviours because those behaviours don't just impact our own businesses, they impact the whole supply chain, they impact the whole industry and, that, and that's definitely a watchword. We are an incredibly adaptable and resilient industry. If you look at how we've changed working practices uh, over the last 10 months and if you look at how we've changed working practice, practices and kind of maintained or even improved productivity. And productivity has been a big challenge for our industry over the years. I think, you know, we need to step back and celebrate that and learn some of those lessons from that point of view. You know, COVID has driven changes in work practices. And we, we have certainly seen as a business that that has driven cost and program efficiencies. The conversation that we're having with supply chains now and our customers is about how we can convert those to, to ongoing sustainable margin, uh, how we can convert those to lowest, uh, lower negotiated opportunities uh, going forward. And that's for the benefit of all. That's for the benefit, lower prices for customers. That's kind of uh, increased turnover negotiated opportunity for us, likewise with the supply chain. But it isn't about margin erosion. It's about, it's about maintaining good sustainable margins. Those changing working practices, um, you know, do give us rise to generate tax and investment benefits. And, and one thing that I'd certainly, you know, say to those that aren't talking to BDO about them, do, you know, pick up the phone, organise the Teams, the Zooms meeting, whatever it is we do nowadays. But there are huge opportunities to look about how you can invest in your business from those things that you can get. We're seeing positive signs in the marketplace. Um, we're definitely seeing, you know, decisions that have been on hold. We, we've had a couple of projects already uh, in, in since the, the turn of the year where decisions were on hold. Those decisions have been made and we're now getting on with those projects. I think the important thing, as Paul talked about, for, from us, uh, and we, you know, we definitely suggest this as a business, you've got to think about how you retain uh, and generate your capital over the next two years even though we're seeing positive signs now, as, as Paul alluded to, as changes in other markets and markets that procure our services, we need to make sure that we've got resilience in our balance sheets, resilience in our, our financial covenants for, for 22 and beyond. Next slide, please, Sean. So again, just looking at Brexit, COVID, government, inter government intervention and supply chain a bit further, you know, one of the things there, how worried are you about the risk of supply chain failure? Fairly worried, marginally worried, extremely worried. Um, you know, very few of us are, are not worried at all. And, and I think that's, that's absolutely the right position to be in with the industry. Um, the combined effects of both Brexit and CODIV, you know, have almost created, though, the perfect opportunity for us to review and assess the length of our industry's supply chains. And what I mean by that is, you know, our, our supply chains manufactured by raw materials a lot from abroad and, and our, how much of that can we really change and influence? But it has given an opportunity to ha have a look and how we can change those supply chains. Do we need to be looking to procure uh, onshore before we procure offshore? You know, even down to things like car, I know of, again, not affecting us, but one contractor which is suffering with uh, carpets being brought in from China, when there is a perfectly uh, good equivalent, perhaps maybe even better, uh, onshore opportunity, but actually there's a percentage points in the price, so we automatically go for offshore, 
how does that truly affect uh, your kind of delivery on site? So I think, I think what's going on at the moment, Brexit and COVID gives us a true opportunity to reflect on that. Government intervention, um, forget your political persuasion. I think when we look at furlough, bounce back, et cetera, et cetera, has been, you know, have all been positive. They've all been positive interventions. And, and, and you know, I class us as a small contractor, small developer, small kind of offsite uh, kind of manufacturer as such in this, in this industry. And, you know, you can, you can look at the historic press and everything else and large or small have taken uh, the opportunity and the benefits of those positive interventions. And as Paul said, you know, we've been allocated essential and we've kept going. But as an industry, we need to support, uh, we need support to plan for the changes that are coming. You know, again, and Lee and, <clears throat> and some of the BDO team are going to talk about those in the future that will have some serious impact on us. Um, so we do need to plan for those. We certainly are, um, you know, and again, and BDO uh, are there to talk to you about that. So that they could have big consequences for, for the industry and, and our businesses. The supply chain, unfortunately, I think there are some uh, that are relying on, on furlough, bounce back and all the rest of it. Um, and, and our industry isn't known at the supply chain end of it for, for a sector that retains capital within the businesses. Um, so, you know, our watchword is beware of the zombie business and manage your counterparty risk. Understand who else your supply chain is working for. Uh, you, could be, you could have a good supply chain partner working for you today, but they could be working for someone who could be suffering in the future. And unfortunately, if that member of supply chain gets knocked on evaluation, doesn't get their final account, that can have serious repercussions for you. So, you know, from a supply chain point of view, going through this and coming out of it, beware of your counterparty risk. Next slide, please. How are we feeling about the future? That, that's we as us, as Claritas. Um, I'm pleased to say that I'm one of the 16% the that sits in the very positive. Obviously, that's from the point of view of security that we have, not just in pipeline of opportunity, uh, the level of uh, financial security that our balance sheet gives us from that point of view. But I do understand the, the, the dichotomy. You know, we, if, if you look at the survey, we all anticipate increased profitability and revenue, but none of us are getting over, o, overly excited and we're, and we're still showing concerns. But I think, you know, the, the feeling for me is how do we build on the collaboration that we've seen across the value chain due to COVID? And, the, and in certain instances, uh, Brexit and how that can change your procurement uh, philosophies. We must, though, take accountabilities for the decisions that add value to yours and your customers' businesses. You know, that's about lower than cost bidding. That's about the supply chain decisions you make. All of those decisions add value to your business and your customers' businesses and your supply chain businesses. So take accountabilities that for the decisions that, you're, that you are and we are making today and the impact that they'll have on the future. And hopefully that will maintain us in a positive position going forward. Next slide, please. So what's our biggest business and operational concerns? Well, you can see from some of the slides there, labour availability, domestic supply chains, regulation, political environment, all of those are things that, um, you know, will impact us in no doubt. We're an eternally optimistic business, uh, and I am myself. So, you know, we try and look at these challenges as what's the opportunities. From a productivity point of view, I touched on it earlier, productivity has been, has been something that we've talked about as an industry for a long time, how we improve it. The key thing for us about improving productivity is about the people you invest, the systems that you invest in and the processes. And that can also, you know, the processes and systems is about manufacturing. You know, we launched Magna Offsite Solutions and the innovation partnerships that sit within Magna Offsite Solutions to build on uh, our experience over the last seven, eight years of building an awful lot um, and contracting an awful lot with manufacturing partners and long-term customer relationships who want to build from manufactured solutions. But that takes investment. That absolutely takes investment. The labour availability and skills cap, it's real and it's getting worse. You know, it's affecting all of us. And, and in some ways, you know, we're all fighting for the same talent and, and that ultimately just drives our cost bases. A big focus for us is about how we're looking to automate, automate our processes, how we use data 
uh, and manufacturing uh, creates a huge opportunity for us to be more profitable. I'm, I'm never afraid about talking to profit, whether a customer's on the line, a supply chain uh, is with us. Profitability is what we all strive for. And I think, you know, we as an industry, we, we create huge amounts of data, whether that's program, whether that's cost, quality. What we don't do all too often is use that data in an efficient way. And we don't automate how we collect and use that data. Uh, and we're largely focusing on that. That comes with an adoption in digital and manufacturing. We are spending money to change what we do. There's no doubt about it. And how are we doing that? Yes, we're investing and retaining our profit uh, and investing that in the business, but we're also generating R&D credits to invest. Uh, again, uh, no, no shameful in this plug, you know, BDO can be there to help you. Um, COVID and Brexit as a combined influence has shown us what we need. You know, do we need to shorten our value chains? Do we need to look at how we contract with, part contract with partners, both customers and supply chain? Because inevitably, we, we've all shown that if we work together to get over a challenge to solve a problem, we inevitably all get a better result. Next slide, please. What do you feel needs to be done to improve confidence in the construction industry? You know, if you look at the, if you look at the graph to the right hand side, greater collaboration, we all talk about it, greater training opportunities, greater adoption of innovation. I, I take all of that and I, and I wholeheartedly agree with it. But being controversial, I think we all need to collectively take accountability for the, how the industry operates. And that's contractors and subcontractors bidding at less than cost. Consultants, uh, you know, influence it. Customers accept it. We take poor counterparty risk. And there is an absolute lack of investment R&D uh, and generating the financial covenant industry. And do you know what? Good sustainable businesses deliver good sustainable margins. And actually, the good businesses of us, we all get back to the same point. At the end of the project, we all get back to that sustainable margin, mostly, that we want from delivering projects successfully. So good relationships are fundamental to it, and they do get to the same point. The thing that we focus on in our business is what is the transactional cost and loss of value for all when poor decisions influence influence tender prices and all of those so you know for me take accountability for your own actions focus on how you generate your own sustainable margins and some of those concerns will take care of themselves not all because there are many external influences next next slide please Sean. people and skills critical to us all is your company experiencing difficulties in recruiting i'm absolutely in the in the yes of that uh, what do you see as the biggest barriers to attracting and retaining talent you know, aging workforce is there and it is actually because we're, we're losing a lot of skills in the business and that is creating some of the, the gaps and knowledge in the skills and that. But perception of the industry is, is absolutely critical for me. And I go back to my prior slide. We've got to take accountability ourselves for that. How do we focus on that? Well, we recruit to cultural fit and competency. We train and develop the skills and behaviours you want. And, set, and we set the culture and we try and set a reward structure that inspires <laughs> If only that was easy, if only it was that easy. It truly isn't, I, I fully understand that. Uh, and we're all competing for the talent. Kind of key themes for me, remember your culture eats your strategy. If you've got a strategy to work with the right customers at the highest margin, if your culture is lower than cost bidding, is to be contractual, your culture is always gonna eat your strategy and, not, and you're gonna get underperforming results. Attracting the next generation is the hardest part. And that's not just attracting the next generation to our business. It's, it's attracting it to the industry because of that perception piece. But again, we, we must take perception of it. But in final point, we can be proud of what we've achieved in the last 10 months. And I, you know, I, I've been going into London, still am. And, and if actually you look at how the skyline of London and our cities generally have changed while we've been away, there's a lot there that we can be proud of, absolutely. And you only have to walk around our cities and point and say, that as a, construction, as a construction industry, that's what we deliver. And there is an absolute lot to be proud of from that point of view. So from my point of view, let's work together uh, to change the perception. And, and then we can all focus on it from the point of view of the, uh, from the business. Next slide, please. And final. 
you know, so, so these final slides are, are just some important a reference to important graphs, and you'll see this. Uh, you'll see this when you when you get the slides online. All, all I'm trying today here is just point to some of the most important slides in there, and, and actually think about how your business uh, is affected by those slides. That's important. Now, that's the, the things that are important to me. You can point to all of those. Take a look at them on the uh, on the survey. And again, thanks to BDO, uh, and I look forward to hearing the uh, the other presentations. Over to you, Lee. Well, thank you. I'll just jump in first. Thank you, John. Very insightful, clear messages there. Uh, I like the fact that we can be proud. Um, I think clearly um, resilience and adaptability were mentioned uh, several times, and I think that's absolutely correct. And the people challenges, retaining talents and creating a culture of inspiration uh, are all good messages. Also, thank you, John, for your plugs on R&D, et cetera. So always welcome. <laughs> um, Lee, Lee is a Lee Causa is the partner in our business restructuring construction specialist team. Uh, I've personally worked with Lee for, for many years now, actually, and, and his ability to help turn around companies uh, that are poor performing is really why I wanted Lee to present today. So I won't say any more. I'm conscious of time. So Lee, over to you, sir. Thanks, Paul. And uh, uh, apologies for those listening, but um, it seems to be lunchtime in the homeschooling uh, part of the, the house and my kids have just taken now has been the precise moment to start making a lot of noise. Um, I guess from listening to Paul and John, um, there's a lot of positivity at the moment within the construction sector. Um, city centre skylines are showing a lot of crane activity, a lot of infrastructure in, infrastructure projects and works are ongoing. Um, and construction alongside manufacturing um, has really been a focus of government throughout 2020 as a means of keeping um, the wheels of the economy turning. So I guess the, the question is why have a restructuring professional participating in, in in the webinar um, and inevitably that's to that's to bring a, a bit of a sense of realism. Um, the, the slide here shows the number of corporate failures that have happened within the construction sector and the market as a whole um, over a period of time and then particularly within 2020. Um, what we've seen in 2020 is that corporate insolvency in the construction sector has fallen by 27%. Um, so from about 3,200 to about 2,000. Um, whereas the, the previous trend from 2015 through to 2019 had seen a, a steady increase in the number. But this is a bit of an artificial position to think that all is well because the number of failures fell during 2020. Um, because the underlying trend here is that all insolvencies fell by the same percentage. Um, what underpins the fall in, in corporate insolvency within the construction sector is pretty much underpinned by um, a significant drop in the fall of liquidations, which by their nature tend to relate to smaller companies much further down the supply chain. Um, and the, the fall in insolvency in that number constitutes about 87% of the difference. Um, and this is where references to risking supply chain um, are, are really coming from. Um, I think one of the, the important points here, and we can see it from the chart on the, on the bottom of this slide, is that year in, year out, construction ranks as the number one sector for corporate insolvency. Um, there have been a couple of years where there were some anomalous results, um, where there were a large number of service companies that were liquidated. Um, but throughout the, the last 11 years, construction has either been the number one or the number two sector. So what does this mean? Um, unfortunately, there's the real risk here of, um, of what's been referred to previously on the webinar um, in terms of zombie companies and those that in a normalized market um, would most likely have fallen into an insolvency process during the last 12 months. Next slide, please. So I guess so, some of the questions are, why has this happened? Why has there been a, a, a fall? Um, and so I'm not proposing to talk through the, this slide in any great amount of depth, but what this is intended to articulate is the range of gov government initiatives that have been available 
um, both over the course of the last 10 to 11 months, but also that continue to be available over the course of the next quarter. Um, this has been sort of met by inherent uncertainty um, within the economy as a whole. Um, and it's been somewhat exacerbated by the impact of uh, features such as Brexit, um, whereby the, the, the true impact, I don't think we will know for, for some time yet, and also the introduction of some insolvency reform with the new SEGA um, insolvency options around moratoriums and restructuring plans. Again, these are both very much in their infancy and haven't been widely used, but are anticipated to be used more as we move forward. They're very much drive of the government as a means of reducing the number of corporate insolvency into administration and liquidation and help preserve the survival of the business. A key factor in those are the uh, what's referred to as the ipso facto provisions, with which without getting into the legalities of it, ultimately mean that it is more difficult for suppliers to stop supplying businesses that um, use these restructuring tools. Um, and I guess a, a final point here is it would be counterintuitive to think that the government would um, allow a big influx of insolvencies in one fell swoop um, by lifting the curtain on a number of the measures that are being made available and just allowing a tidal wave of insolvency. I think everybody accepts that that would not be useful. Next slide, please. The challenges that are faced within construction are very similar to what's been faced um, for, for many, many years, um, but have just been made slightly more problematic over the course of the last 12 months due to the pandemic. Um, there are recurring issues with regard to pricing matters, um, competitive tension and aggressive bid bidding, um, and the concept of bidding below cost and the margin implication that that results in. Um, contractual risk with customers and risk of default um, and the reference we've already had to zombies. Um, there are inevitable labour and productivity issues which have uh, become more pronounced as a result of the pandemic and resource planning and have been highlighted within our survey. And there's always the, the, um, the overriding impact impact of the risk within the sector, which sometimes dissuade lender appetite from lending money to corporates. And this has been made more challenging with HMRC regaining their preferential creditor status in the event of an insolvency. And in, in addition, there are obviously the, the impact of further restrictions within uh, due to COVID, which we don't know what they may be and if they would be implemented. Next slide, please. To help manage through, um, through the current time and build resilience and protect value, there are a number of various areas to consider. Um, I, I don't propose to, to read through um, those on the left-hand side of this slide in, in any great depth, but to pick out some of the challenges and benefits. Um, managing your supplier and customer risk is crucial. It's becoming more widely accepted as the norm to undertake more due diligence into your supplier network um, to maintain and assess the financial stability of that chain to mitigate risk of failure impacting on your own ability to provide to your customer. Much firmer cash flow management tools to um, improve visibility over cash flow and provide early warnings of any issues that may be um, about to occur and altogether demonstrating good governance to, to funders. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, it's, it starts to build, br bridge some of this together. Um, one of the key questions put to me was, how do we bridge the funding gap when, where, when we are a corporate and we need money? Um, and my, my overriding take on this is somebody who is regularly asked by lenders to consider the risk of uh, write down of some of their lends to businesses is lenders will be supportive of lending money to good businesses with good robust management practices. Um, there are a number of issues within this within construction as a sector which we've highlighted but really with good housekeeping, good forecasting and scenario planning, proper due diligence being undertaken on the supply chain, um, 
points around collaboration within the supply chain that have been previously mentioned on the webinar and passing on efficiencies and profitability throughout that. Uh, and ultimately the concept of asking yourself why. Why are we bidding for this new piece of work? Do we have the resources to be able to deliver on this? Is it profitable revenue that we will be bolting into our business or are we at risk of running out of cash and over trading um, by winning this new piece of work? These are some of the high level tips that businesses can introduce or expand upon to be more successful, both within their own day-to-day -day management, but also with appealing to the lender market to help secure and bridge the funding gap that may exist. And uh, that concludes my presentation and I'll hand um, back to Paula and Ollie. Many thanks. Thank you, Lee. Um, again, some really good messages there. I love the, the why question um, and ensure it's profitable revenue was quite key. And don't over trade as, uh, as the usual. So th thank you very much, Lee. Uh, my next uh, speaker is uh, Ollie Back. Ollie is a partner in our contract commercial risk services group. Uh, he's got extensive experience working with infrastructure projects. He's worked with HS2, et cetera, and many more. Um, he'll focus now on supplier and contract management. Over to you, Ollie. Thanks, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I just wanted to spend a few minutes just picking up on some of the supply chain threads that we've we've heard from Lee and John, um, you know, clearly uh, as part of the survey, uh, I think it was 91% of uh, of the respondents expressed some degree of concern at least to supply chain failure, both now and and in the the medium term. Um, and I, you know, it's it's not hard to understand why. I mean, we're living in the one year in a hundred where you know global lean just in time supply chains just haven't really worked. Um, so we've certainly seen since April last year, a huge amount of activity from our clients, not just in the construction sector, but also um, uh, beyond that, uh, in terms of what they've been doing in order to try and build resilience and, and thrive um, in this environment. So, I mean, it's a huge uh, topic of conversation here, and I can't hope to, to touch on everything. Um, but I've just picked out a few key themes that we've witnessed, um, which will hopefully be of use to you. And obviously, after this, we'd be very happy to, to take any other questions if you have them. Um, I think the, the main thing uh, for me is just to, to get a sense of, of how people have responded over the last 12 months. Clearly, we've had a global pandemic. And between April and probably August last year, everything that we were speaking to clients about was how to react and build resilience through their supply chains as a result of COVID. And then very quickly in August, something quite, quite interesting happened where that became less of an issue and people started to just talk about Brexit. Um, obviously, as we're now through that, and obviously a number of implications that are still uh, sticking points as a result of that, but there's something that has really struck us is that actually when you're, when you're looking about supply chain resilience and risk, it's, it's about really pinning together all of these interconnected factors. It's not just about COVID. It's not just about Brexit, but there are a whole suite of things which need to be considered. And perhaps the one thing overall underpinning everything is the, the, the economic environment and recession. Uh, likely deep recession and protracted recession we're, we're about to experience. Um, and clearly the risk of business failure is going to be heightened uh, and will be for some time. So, you know, we're working with a number of clients who are looking to try and get greater transparency over what their supply chain risk is and also helping them to then act upon it. So I'll start to maybe talk a, a few areas where, where that's being, um, where, where, we're happy, where, we're, where we're helping suppliers. Yeah, the first and foremost is around identifying how resilient are your suppliers? You know, the most basic approach there is to do uh, to run regular credit rating reports and things like that. But actually, as uh, as John said, it's also about understanding well what proportion of of that supplier's business do you represent, and where are their exposures? Um, a, an example from uh, from the pharmaceutical space over the last few months is that we've been working with a medical devices firm. And their uh, demand for their um, injection products has actually been quite buoyant throughout the pandemic. Now, one of the components within there is a tiny spring. And on the face of it, you would think, well, the demand has gone up, so therefore this supplier should be pretty stable. But actually, when you start to unpick what that supplier and also the, the, the supplier's broader um, uh, corporate family, what, what exposures uh, they have, it was quite clear that actually the vast majority of their business was related to suspension units for the automotive sector, which, as we all know, has, has really suffered. So all of a sudden, 
what on the face of it looked like a fairly stable supplier, when you start to peel back and, and do a bit more due diligence, um, it can present quite a different picture. Um, we've already talked about prompt payment codes, uh, so I don't necessarily want to go into too much detail there, but obviously, you know, it's a major issue across all sectors. Um, I think at the latest estimate, there was around £23 billion worth of uh, late and overdue invoices in circulation within the UK at the moment. Um, and making sure that you're paying throughout the supply chain promptly can really help bolster resilience across the uh, supply chain. Um, so quite an easy win there. Um, you've also heard a bit more about onshoring and nearshoring um, and about diversifying your supplier base. Um, I mean, even at the macro level, we've seen in the last 12 months that China has lost about $90 billion, pound, uh, $90 billion worth of uh, international trade with the US alone. Uh, and the beneficiaries of that have been split between the EU, Mexico um, and South America. So uh, obviously a whole host of geopolitical issues are wrapped up in that as well. But it's just interesting that there is a trend where people are wanting to bring their supplier horizon closer to them. Uh, next slide, please, Sharon. Uh, and if I may, in the last few minutes, just talk about uh, some specific contractual points. I noticed that um, contractual disputes was an area of concern. Um, and naturally, in times like this, you will expect to see uh, an uptick in, um, in disputes. Uh, what we're trying to say, though, is yes, absolutely establish what your position is in your contracts and where your commercial exposures are. That's absolutely sacrosanct. But we would very, very strongly encourage that to be you know, going down the dispute road as, as an absolute last resort. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about collaboration over the last, uh, you know, last 40 or so minutes. And I think the construction industry has, has been a real um, example of, of how you know, the, the sector as a whole has, has realized that actually it's not just about your own business surviving and coming through the end of this, um, this period. It's about having your entire value chain and those relationships intact and strengthened uh, as a result. So definitely know your contractual position, but before you press that legal button, um, see what the art of the possible is open up communication channels and, and collaborate to find um, appropriate solutions. And the final area I wanted to talk about was just around how you optimize contractual performance. Uh, you see the, the gray box on the right hand side of the screen there. That is uh, as a result of a survey carried out in 2017 by uh, World Commerce and Contracting. Now they surveyed over 500 businesses, big and small across the world, across a number of sectors. Um, and their findings were that weaknesses within contract and commercial management actually results in quite substantial value leakage. Um, you know, the quote there, 9% of revenue. So clearly getting this right, um, especially in an environment where uh, there's a lot of economic and cost pressures, is, uh, is a very valuable lever to pull. So take a look at your contracts. How are they performing? Are you being charged in line with the commercial principles and the terms of the contract? And are your teams equipped to, to manage and get the most value out of your supply chain and also indeed your customer contracts as well? Um, given where we are with time, I think I'll leave it there and, and hand back to Paul. Um, but if you have any questions, please do ask. Um, if we don't get to them in this Q&A, then uh, please uh, feel free just to get in touch directly as well. Thanks. Thanks, Ollie. Again, really good. Uh, I think the last slide there says it all. So poor contract management costs... 9% of your revenue. So we uh, say no more on that one. Um, so our, our final speaker is uh, Rob Williams. Rob is a key member of our real estates and construction team. Rob has got some really interesting insights into tax, both during COVID and also post COVID and how you can help your business save tax. Over to you, Rob. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, to kick off with a bit of context, those of you that were able to join our construction industry webinar back in April last year may recall that much of what I talked about then was inevitably focused on COVID-19, particularly the specific measures introduced by the government to support businesses through the pandemic. Now, the, the majority of the C-19 support measures put in place back then are, of course, still around, uh, albeit with refinements in certain cases, uh, but unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. So next slide. And unfortunately, from a tax perspective, a lot of the bad news that was put on hold almost a year ago and replaced with giveaways is now returning to the fore and will potentially be accompanied by a number of new measures to try and pay for those giveaways, uh, which isn't great when construction businesses have enough other problems to deal with. 
I certainly don't have time to cover everything in detail in the, the 10 minutes now, but it would be remiss of me not to highlight some of the key issues for anyone on the call that isn't aware before moving on to do some positive ideas that businesses could consider in response to challenges they're facing given today's sort of rethink theme. So next slide. So go, going in chronological order, Brexit has of course finally happened. The slide here highlights a number of the key tax points coming from Brexit, but certainly not all. And in the time available, I just want to focus on a couple of these. The good news is that a deal was of course agreed, which included provision for a zero duty rate on imported goods, which means that it should be possible for construction businesses to continue to bring supplies in from the EU without customs duty. As with any relief, there are however conditions that must be met. And in particular, if goods do not have preferential origin status, customs duty will still be due. And we're seeing this catching out some firms in certain cases. And of course, customs declarations will, I'm afraid, now be required. If you want to know more about the custom changes, uh, there's actually a grant scheme that enables businesses to pay firms such as BDO to provide them with customs duty training and then recover that cost from the government. Um, applications to take advantage of the grant, though, will close on the 30th of June and potentially earlier if all the grant funding is allocated before this date, which it looks like it will be. So if uh, some free customs training would be beneficial, then do get in touch sooner rather than later. On that, the existing rules for imports from non-EU countries now apply to imports from the EU, albeit with some changes. The government's introduced postponed accounting for import VAT on goods bought in to the UK from the 1st of January, which means that UK VAT registered businesses importing goods will be able to account for import VAT on their VAT return rather than paying import VAT at the time the goods arrive at the UK border. And this applies to imports from the EU and non-EU countries. And the supply of services to customers in the EU from the 1st of January is treated the same as those to any customer outside the EU. The VAT treatment will be covered by the usual VAT place of supply rules, which continue to apply broadly as they did previously, but with some changes. Um, withholding tax, the EU parent subsidiary and interest and royalties directive no longer apply. Uh, so from the 1st of January, cross-border payments from EU member states may trigger withholding tax. Uh, the UK has a very substantial double tax treaty network, and many of these eliminate domestic withholding taxes on cross-border payments, but that's certainly not true of all treaties. And uh, if you take the German treaty, for example, a dividend paid by a German subsidiary to its UK parent will now be liable to withholding tax, I'm afraid. So uh, we're aware that the UK is looking to renegotiate treaties with certain European jurisdictions, specifically with the aim of restoring the withholding tax position to that which was available under the EU directives. In other words, to exempt those withholding taxes, but it's unclear if and when this may be achievable. Now, finally, on Brexit, you may have heard some of the press about Treasury officials quietly telling some UK businesses that they should set up in the EU to mitigate some of the issues they are now encountering because of Brexit. If that applies to you, tax needn't be a major issue in so doing, but it goes without saying that setting up overseas will have tax consequences, and you may want to think about how you structure your operations overseas before diving straight in to prevent adverse tax consequences arising. It is a subsidiary limited company required, or could you just set up a branch overseas, for example? Next slide, please. Now, moving away from Brexit, we do, of course, have some domestic changes to deal with. Uh, we now know for certain that the VAT domestic reverse charge, which was originally due to come into force from the 1st of October 2019, and then from 1st of October 2020, will come into effect from the 1st of March. So if you haven't done anything to prepare for this change, and our survey results suggest that just 45% of you have, uh, you really do now need to get your skates on with only three weeks to go. It's a fundamental change to the way that VAT will be accounted for in the construction sector and will have a significant impact on cash flow, working capital and payment processing for the suppliers and recipients of construction services. And don't forget that the VAT that many businesses chose to defer from the second quarter of 2020 under the government's COVID VAT deferral measure will need paying by the 31st of March this year. Although a new option recently announced allows this debt to be paid monthly 
from March 2021 to March 2022 if preferred, but you all have to opt into this and notify. And then the off plan our working reforms will also now definitely be coming into effect from the 6th of April, having previously been deferred from 6th of April 2020 because of the pandemic. Now our survey results suggest 55% uh, of you have either already implemented changes to respond to this or are ready to do so. And certainly the majority of the construction businesses we work with have taken steps to bring people on payroll or moved away from contracting directly with self-employed individuals. But for those using off payroll labour that haven't done anything to prepare and do not qualify for the small companies exemption, do get in touch if you need any help in navigating the changes. And before I talk about the budget, I also wanted to briefly touch on a couple of other areas which are not particularly new, but nevertheless should be borne in mind. Um, the corporate criminal offences legislation came in in September 2017 um, and while there was a light touch approach taken by HMRC for the first year or two, we are now seeing more of a crackdown. For those of you that aren't aware, and our survey suggests only 23% of you are, and the CCO a business can be prosecuted and face an unlimited financial penalty where it fails to prevent an associated person as defined from facilitating tax fraud. Now, any contracts of all labour provider to the business is likely to fall within the definition of an associated person. And so the risks extend throughout the supply chain. Construction businesses can therefore be liable under the CCO legislation, even where they are neither evading tax themselves nor directly facilitating tax fraud. So if you haven't done anything to create a defence from prosecution, you really should now. And if you don't know where to start, do, do get in touch. We've got some specialists that can assist in that regard. And somewhat relatedly, a trend we're also seeing our construction industry supply chain inquiries. Rather than just inquiring into a single company or issue, HMRC are now starting to inquire into whole supply chains to try and tackle perceived non-compliance. HMRC now have an incredible amount of information at their fingertips and they're using that to come down hard. And by way of an example, I recently attended a call with an HMRC task force that has been established to trial a new way of working on major infrastructure projects, starting with HS2 and Hinkley Point C. And HMRC have actually mapped out the entire 1,000 strong HS2 supply chain, each of whom have their part to play in the process and, of course, have their own tax obligations to comply with. Unfortunately, with CCO now around, it's not good enough to assume that because you're compliant, you're going to be unaffected. And we know from our own survey results that supply chain risk is one of the biggest concerns to businesses in the construction sector. So building in due diligence and communication with your supply chain can go hand in hand with managing tax risk. And finally, on current domestic matters, one that was announced yesterday since these slides were put together. Um, I'm sure many of you will have seen the news yesterday about the introduction of new cladding remediation taxes. Now, we don't have all the detail yet, but suffice to say that it seems likely that these new levies will impact a number of you attending the call today. So something to monitor. Next slide, please. Now on to the future. And for those that might have missed it, there's a budget in less than four weeks time on the 3rd of March. As ever, BDO will be providing comprehensive coverage and holding a further webinar on the 4th of March to discuss the key measures but I thought it worthwhile quickly touching on some items that could crop up. Now you may have already seen some press around possible rises in corporation tax and capital gains tax, and it wouldn't be a surprise to see these brought forward as Rishi tries to fill his historic deficit. And following the outcome of a recent consultation into the capital gains regime, it seems likely that there will be some other changes here, perhaps by way of reductions in allowances or withdrawals of reliefs. And we've certainly uh, talking to a number of uh, people about exits before the budget because they're concerned about an increase in CGT or a withdrawal of business asset disposal relief, uh, formerly entrepreneurs relief, or the tax-free relief available on the sale of a business to an employee ownership trust. And in terms of other measures, it's difficult to predict, predict these, but um, successive governments have used the capital allowances regime to incentivize businesses to invest the country out of recession. So it certainly wouldn't be a surprise if the annual investment allowance, which is currently one million pounds, but currently scheduled to reduce to 200,000 from the 1st of January next year, is maintained or even increased. And there have also been some calls from industry bodies for a specific green investment allowance to align with Paris's stated aid 
stated aim of building back better from the pandemic. So look out for that. Next slide. And now finally onto those promised lighter matters and what you can do to rethink your business from a tax perspective, as I did back in April last year. Now, I like to think that every problem has a solution and very often a tax solution. And this time around, I thought the best way to illustrate this would be by taking some of the key findings from our survey on what matters to you and throwing out a few ideas on how the tax system may be able to help on each. Firstly, you told us that one of your biggest concerns is a shortage of skilled labour. Well, did you know that you can get a government grant towards apprenticeship training and claim up to £2,000 as an incentive payment if you hire an apprentice that starts between the 1st of August 2020 and the 31st of March 2021? This is on top of the existing exemption from employers' national insurance contributions for engaging apprentices under the age of 25. Uh, there are a number of tax advantage share schemes and benefits arrangements available. So could you implement these in an effort to retain staff whilst saving ta some tax at the same time? Next, you also told us that while 66% of you expect to, uh, revenue, revenue to increase in the next 12 months, only 54% expect profits to in increase. So to improve that statistic, again, could you offer non-pay benefits to staff such as share incentives to reduce your salaries bill? Could you implement a restructure or rationalisation programme to reduce the number of group companies or divisions and reduce costs? And if care is taken, it may be possible to do this without adverse tax consequences. Are you aware that as well as giving a cash tax benefit, the R&D tax credit scheme for large companies enables the benefit to be recognised in profit before tax rather than the tax line? And then whilst we're talking about R&D, 52% of you told told us that adoption of technology is a step required to improve confidence in the uh, construction industry. If you're not claiming R&D tax credits, and apparently only 38% of you are, then do explore them. Even deploying out of the box profits can actually qualify when some sort of benchmarking is under uh, bespoking is undertaken. And then finally, many of you told us that access to finance and working capital was a key concern, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, next slide. Well, fear not, as I'm going to return to another slide from April very quickly, which contains some of the myriad ways where you may be able to use the tax system to your advantage. Picking up just a few of these, are you expecting to recognise losses? If so, why not try to carry back those losses and reclaim corporation tax previously paid now instead of waiting until the returns are filed in due course? If you're a December year end, for example, even though your 2020 accounts are yet to be drawn up, that doesn't mean you might not be able to lodge a repayment claim now. More generally, um, when was the last time you revisited your structure? In the good times, there have been, may have been no good reason to review it, but what about now? Is it still fit for purpose? Could it be improved with tax and commercial benefits achieved together? So a whistle stop tour there, some of the recent and upcoming uh, changes to tax impacts in the construction industry as well as a couple of ideas to help you deal with some of the challenges you're facing and perhaps rethink your business from a tax perspective. As ever, if you want to get in touch, do uh, let me know and uh, happy to discuss. Back to Paul. Thank you, Rob. Uh, again, some really uh, some key messages there. Um, I kind of looked at the, uh, the budget in four weeks and thought there's uh, going to be some tax rises. So great. Um, and obviously the VAT domestic charge, uh, we did have a question come in about what is that? Um, clearly, uh, I think the, the message loud and clear from Rob is get your planning in place because it's coming in from March 21. So um, I th there's, there's a couple of questions also, uh, actually they seem to be all tax questions. Um, the one was um, for, is there a, a deadline in respect of getting in any, um, the, the deferred VAT for, uh, for COVID-19? with HMRC if you wanted to pay it in instalments. Um, Rob, I don't yeah, yeah, I, th I, I did just touch on that, uh, Paul. I mean, the, the deadline is still fixed as 31 March yeah. this year, but um, there is now a new option that you can you can spread that payment over uh, the, the 12 months to 31 March 2022, but you do need to opt into it. You actually need to file something by the end of June to, to let HMRC know that's what you're going to do. Otherwise, they'll uh, come at you for the, that, the, the VAT that you've deferred and interest and penalties, I'm afraid. Good. We did have one more question that came in. I'm not sure how we 
ever answer something like this, but what's a good margin as an average for the construction industry? I don't know if, John, could you quickly have a, a chance to answer? I, don't, I think it's how long is a piece of string, but... <laughs> I'll try not to give you away. <laughs> what's a good margin for the construction industry? It's inherently poor, I think we all know that, when, when you look at um, you know, PBT from that point of view. Two and a half to five percent is a good margin, uh, unfortunately, on industry. What is gross profit? And I think that's the thing that's quite often referred to on frameworks and tender returns and all the rest of it. Um, we're somewhere around a five percent business, but we can only be that because we accept around about a two and a half percent profit before tax right now. Uh, and we have a very, very uh, kind of lean overhead versus our size of turnover. And we keep growing from that point of view. And as the principal shareholder of the business, I've signed the business up to that structure for five years. Because as my very first slide says, you know, we want to change the way the industry procures and we want to grow market share. Okay. So it's two and a half to five percent is your PBT and, and then the rest of it is overhead structure. OK, we'll leave, we'll leave it there because I'm conscious we've just hit the time. We're, we're a little bit over, actually. So I'm conscious if, if, if there are any of the questions that anybody wanted to ask, uh, please, you've got my email address there. Uh, please submit uh, questions to me and I'll get it out to the rest of the presenters and team. And we will come back to you as soon as we can. Um, so I would like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, and in particular, Sharon Collins, who uh, is, you've not seen her face on this, but she has actually organized everything. So she's done all the hard work. So thank you to her. Thank you to the team that presented. Uh, thank you very uh, kindly to John, who joined us from Claritas. And I hope you all have a fantastic afternoon. I wish you an uh, enjoyable rest of the day and stay safe. Thank you very much.